Today, we are going to be looking at co-occurring conditions related to neurodiversity. And it's a big one. And there's a lot of interesting debate around it. So we are going to get right to it. So today, though neurodiversity is huge, I'm going to keep it simple and I'm going to focus on dyslexia, not so much dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, and even touch upon a bit of Tourette's. But obviously, those are going to be our primary ones. But because we're talking about comorbidity and co-occurring today, naturally, we're going to be talking about all the others. So what exactly does exceptional individuals get up to? Because I see some new people today. And if you've never heard of us, we are a social enterprise that supports neurodiverse individuals, works with organizations to help inclusivity. And our USP is that we are predominantly all neurodiverse. So myself included, I have a whole heap of co-occurring conditions, which makes life extra fun. And today we are going to be talking about one, what is it? But two, if you have one and another, does that change the playing field a bit? Say if you're getting treatment for autism, but you also have anxiety, is that then quite different? Like it's so difficult and we are going to be tackling that question. But just a quick one. We do webinars every single week for the rest of eternity. So if you have missed any of them, check out our YouTube channel. Our last one was how to get a diagnostic assessment for dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, and ADHD. And we have a whole heap of them. So I highly encourage it. So what exactly are we covering today? Well, we're going to go with a quick overview or comorbidity. We're then going to dive in deep on autism, dyslexia, ADHD. We're going to have a bit of a discussion, might get a bit controversial. And then we're going to look on further support and other areas you can look into. So neurodiversity, comorbidity. Comorbidity, that's a bit of a morbid word. Doesn't sound that empowering, does it? And as such, we typically don't use it that often. We use um, co-occurring. And that's just because it has a different connotation. But honestly, they mean exactly the same thing. And in a medical setting, comorbidity is going to be the term that you hear most frequent. So I will be using those terms interchangeably today, but that is the reason why there are multiple terms. So to start off with a quick definition, comorbidity just means having more than one disorder in the same person. So let's say you have autism and dyslexia, that would be having a comorbidity, one or more. If any of you do have, say, ADHD, dyslexia, autism, dyspraxia, then the likelihood of having something else is incredibly high. And we will be questioning why that is. It's also quite a useful way of figuring out whether or not it's worth getting a diagnosis. Because let's say, for example, one of you, you, you have quite severe anxiety or bipolar and you're not sure if you're neurodiverse as well. Well, when you realize how these link up, it might be something worth investigating. The goal of today isn't to make all of you think that you have everything under the sun, but just to give you a bigger appreciation that nothing is as ever as black and white as we'd like it to be. If you say go to your, if you're in school and you say, I have dyslexia and they're supporting you for dyslexia and you're finding that support isn't working for you, it might be because there's something else going on under the side. Another word as well as co-occurring is coexistence. Uh, and basically the same meaning, just like the other one, less clinical. I don't typically use that one as much, but just because you might hear that one at the same time. So just some of the things that can co-occur with neurodivergence, and this is honestly the tip of the iceberg, there is a lot. You could have another neurodivergent. So for instance, um, dyslexia is normally is quite heavily diagnosed, but yet dysgraphia is not. But dysgraphia and dyslexia, you know, they're two peas in the pod. They go together all the time, but they are unique individual conditions. So for example, you could have dysgraphia, which is about writing, and dyslexia together, or one and not the other. You can also have anxiety. Now, when we talk about anxiety and depression, we're not just talking about your everyday, oh, I'm not sure about that, not feeling great. We're talking about um, a clinical depression or clinical or anxiety disorder, things that 
affect you every single day. Bipolar, Tourette's, OCD, sleep problems, even drug addictions. Uh, the list honestly goes on and on. For autism, for example, you might not believe this, but uh, it can affect your um, bowels as well. Uh, it can affect how your body digests. It, it can affect your breathing. It, uh, it isn't just to do with communication, which is a common misconception. So this is where we're getting a little bit technical. And this is from a paper which essentially says the way we kind of uh, categorize co-occurring conditions is really way too vague. Because to say someone, if you have autism and you have uh, dyslexia, is that different from having autism and having like more likely to have migraines? You know, the two things are a bit different. So this person decided to categorize it into three sections. The first one is truly co-occurring. So I'm going to translate it because it's written in kind of science talk. But it's basically it's something you are born with. So shares an epidemiological origin with autism spectrum disorder in utero, which essentially means before you're born, as a defining characteristics. So is it part of you when you are born? Essentially, can you separate it from autism? If you can't really separate it, that might be truly co-occurring, like it is kind of one. The next one is resulting. So we're using autism as an example here. Caused by ASD related disparity of the health effect of behavior developed to cope with ASD symptoms. All this means is, let's say, you know, being autistic in a neurotypical world, in a world that wasn't designed for how your brain works, is bloody tough. And as such, that could make you severely depressed, give you anxiety. You know, these are things which happen as a result of being neurodivergent. You're not born being anxious, but it, you become anxious. And it's not something you can really separate because you are always going to be living in a world which wasn't made for you. And the last one is associated. This is the category where we're like, we have no idea. We'll just bung it in the extra category. It's conditions that are more common in individuals with ASD, yet probably not exactly part of it. So, you know, the old expression, um, correlation doesn't equal causation, which means yeah, people with autism, for example, or people with dyslexia might have a higher likelihood of having allergies like hay fever. Is that genetically, is it part of it or is it not? That is what we mean by associated. So we're going to start off with autism comorbidities. And all of this stuff was, I've noted the research where we got it from, in case you want to dive deep. This is a particularly interesting paper from uh, published in the World Journal of Clinical Practitioners. Honestly, I'm not expecting you to read it. It's a bit wordy, but hopefully I've summarized the key points for you so you can leave with the best learnings. So the first question I want to ask you is that comorbidities are more common in children with ASD than in the general population. Do you think this true or false? And I want you to try to ask yourself from like a medical perspective as well, because we all have our hunches, but it's interesting to know, does the data actually back this up? And I see at the moment, 100% of you have said true. And yeah, it is. Now, it's really interesting. Why are people with autism more likely to have another condition? This begs the question, is autism its own condition or is it a symptom of a larger condition? And this is where we're getting in a bit of unknown territory and we're going to touch upon it later. But there is debate around this because I think it's something like 95 percent of people with autism have something else. You know, that is nearly 100 percent. So it makes you wonder is that why is it not part of the same diagnosis and why are they separate? Really interesting. And uh, we don't have an exact answer yet, but we're starting to ask those questions. And if you think it's not really that um, mind boggling or like unfeasible, because if you think about autism has been autism, classic autism, high functioning, low functioning, um, Asperger's, you know, we've had many, many names in the past. 
And the better we get at developing and understanding it, the more our definition changes. This is why we now call it autism spectrum disorder, because new data information has come to light, which means that name better articulates what we mean. There's no reason to believe that the name isn't going to change again in the future. So that's also worth keeping in mind. Now, here, what, here, here are just a small handful of other comorbidities that are heavily linked to autism. I want you to just smash on the ones which you are most surprised by. Or are these that you're like, no way. And I'll quickly go over them if you've never heard of some of them. We've got fragile X syndrome, which is really like people, I think, again, like about 90% of people with fragile X syndrome also have autism. That's essentially do with like bones and also like a uh, developmental condition. You've got Down syndrome, which also has a high comparison. But it's important to remember that these don't go both ways. So if you have Down syndrome, you're very likely to have autism. If you have autism, that doesn't mean you're as likely to have Down syndrome, but you're more likely than the general population. Then we've got do, do the muscular dystrophy. Uh, that's essentially like weak bones. Um, uh, epilepsy, which is another really common one. Cerebral palsy, IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. Believe it or not, there's a lot of research on this um, that people with autism are more likely to have IBS. Uh, not really what you want to hear, but it's important to know that you might think, wait a sec, I have that and that. Maybe it's not as random as you think. Food intolerance. There tends to be a higher amount of gluten intolerance amongst the autistic population. Allergies. People with autism are more likely to be uh, allergic to pollen and other things. I can contest to that. Very true. And sleep disorders. But bear in mind, this doesn't, this isn't just related to autism. People with ADHD, for example, often have sleep disorders. There's been research from those with dyslexia that have allergy conditions. Now, there is research that says this isn't just antidotal, but there isn't enough on it to say like definitively, but still interesting to see how these all link up. So a bit more on autism comorbidity. We've got a whole spectrum of here that can like link up. A large amount of children with autism are also have neuroflammation. Uh, um, you could have parts where your brain is more sensitive. Uh, alternative inflammation. Uh, so for instance, uh, parts of your body can like swell up and that can result into hypersensitivity. So we always, we know that people with autism experience sensitivity to a greater length though you can also have the opposite. But sometimes it's not just uh, psychological, it's also physical. Uh, so it's why that sometimes certain stress factors can make your head hurt more than others, or your hearing might be impaired as a result. Really interesting. You've also got uh, a high likelihood of having a poor immune system. So if you have autism and you're ever like, why am I always ill? It could be connected. So on this one thing here, these are some. So we've got specific learning difficulties, ADHD, anxiety, Tourette's, OCD, developmental coordination disorder, gifted, nice, auditory processing, depression. All these things, you can't really separate them from autism. There's not many autistic people that will say, well, actually, I don't have any of these qualities. And then it always brings us back to the question, are these separate conditions or is this just part of the criteria or what it means to be autistic? You know, it's a fine line between this is a trait of autism. This is a characteristic of autism. This is something which relates to being autism or is attached to it. How do you know what is what and what is separate? Does it even matter? These are questions which we don't completely have the answer for yet, but maybe we will. So Indigo says, I was diagnosed with polyarthritis long before my autism diagnosis. And do you know what? That's um, really interesting, Indigo, because most people, um, particularly people who are maybe 40 plus now, were diagnosed with, say, anxiety, depression, other conditions way before they were diagnosed with ASD. And it's annoying that 
you have to do that because maybe you're giving medication and it's not the right fit for you. And only later you find out your diagnosis. But for a, um, a doctor, psychiatrist, a pediatrician, in order to give you a diagnosis, they have to rule out other elements first. So honestly, not surprising. Moving on to dyslexia comorbidities, what kind of goes hand in hand with dyslexia? We've already mentioned that things like dysgraphia, dyscalculia, go together with dyslexia. But interestingly, more people are diagnosed with dyslexia than dysgraphia, but yet they just seem to be kind of different ways of expressing dyslexia. So the dyslexic theories assume that reading difficulties stem from dyslexia are linked to visual, auditory, phonological, or statistical learning mechanisms. Uh, so what this is saying is that these are all like individual things that can affect dyslexia. For some people, it might just be a visual mechanism or an auditory mechanism. However, we still consider this dyslexia regardless of which way, your, why it affects you the way it does. So think of it like there's like lots of mini diagnosis in one big one, but yet we call this dyslexia. But if it's to do with maths, for example, we'll call that um, dyscalculia. So the way we kind of like cut things up as in separate, subcategory, completely different, non-relevant, you know, there maybe, you know, there is logic behind it, but also sometimes it comes down to when it was, uh, when it was uh, discovered. It comes down to different policies. It comes down to the amount of funding in certain areas as well. So here's a quick question for you. Dyslexia stems from a core deficit, but how does it affect you? So we know that dyslexia um, can affect memory, reading, writing, spelling, but essentially it originates from one core spot and how it presents itself honestly can be different depending who you are. Are there any characteristics to you in terms of how it affects you? And I'm looking for kind of more like obscure ones if you have any other ideas. So not just kind of reading and writing. Okay, Melanie says, I had a whole host of difficulties at school, but my reading and spelling was my strongest point. And you honestly, that's absolutely true. You can have dyslexia and still be a really good reader and writer. It's more about how the brain develops than anything else in particular. I think for me, probably the biggest thing is memory. I really struggle with memory, organizational skills, maybe time management, but I don't think that's the biggest thing. St uh, stress. Stress is a mega one for me. And I'll tell you what, the reading and the spelling are definitely issues for me, but they're not like the primary issue. For me, it's by far the stress and the memory. New lexicon, so new words. Absolutely. I really struggle with pronunciation. Like I had a meeting yesterday with a uh, lady called Gillian, and I kept calling her Gillian. And though she had told me what her name was and how to pronounce it, I still pronounced it wrong. And it was really frustrating. So as I said, with dyslexia, you are very likely or well, more likely, should we say, than the general population to be diagnosed with one of the other most prominent neurodiversities. So having ASD, again, is really common, but not as common as some of the others. So for example, a lot of people with autism are excellent readers um, and are able to work well with phonologics, but there definitely is a connection between communication, how your brain develops certain ways of communicating. So it might not be related to autism in, in every sense, but there is a link. Then you've got ones like, oh, which one will it land on? Dyspraxia. And dyspraxia and dyslexia are really common. Where dyslexia is about reading, dyspraxia is more about the motor coordination condition. So it can affect how you use speech, as well as movement. They also go together quite heavily. You're more likely to be diagnosed with dyslexia than you are dyspraxia, but statistically, they're about as likely as each other. Um, but interestingly, not as many people have heard that. 
Donna says, when people tell me their telephone numbers, I can't understand it. And I cannot process online documentaries, e- uh, uh, documents easily. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like there'll be certain things. I, I struggle with numbers as well. And when I say struggle, I mean, really, someone will say, okay, 023. And I'm like, 02, 028. And they'll say 023. I'm like, okay, 028. And I'll just keep saying it wrong. It, it, it's honestly, it's a nightmare. And the last one, we had ADHD, which again is likely, but not um, not guaranteed. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. Just because I'm saying you're likely to have something doesn't mean you are. You're more likely than the general population, at least. So now moving on to ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. ADHD has a lot of co-occurrence. And to be honest with you, some of them aren't the most favorable. Uh, so we'll get into a bit more about that. Suri says, dyslexia hasn't been impactful to me as ADHD, although I'm not sure if I didn't notice, but I started learning Python and I couldn't make common sense gaps feels when I could read. I don't understand much about uh, like coding, but I could, uh, it's something that I know I wouldn't be able to do because my brain will miss out gaps and I, I will not notice. So let's say like uh, there's a spelling, there's a word missing. My brain will read it as if it is already there. Uh, and it will take someone else to read it back to me for me to say, wait a second. So ADHD. Here are, um, if you are only 30% of those with ADHD only have ADHD. Interesting, all right? That's like the minority. But you're very likely to have a learning disorder such as dyslexia, 50% as likely, Operation uh, ODD, 30 to 50, autism, about 25%, anxiety, 25, motor disorders like dyspraxia, also about 50, and depression, 20. It's really interesting when you look at this and you're like, damn, I'm as likely to have a motor uh, coordination disorder as I am not to have one. And yet these aren't always characteristics which people are told about. Like if you go to your teacher or employer and say, oh, I have ADHD, they'll think it's about attention. They probably won't have that understanding that it probably also relates to how you learn and write and walk and talk. You know, they're so connected, but people don't associate them with them, which normally means that you might not be getting the correct support. We've got some interesting comments here. Madeline says, I have to create the image of numbers in my mind to recognize it. Nice. Sari says, one thing I've noticed is that when I have to flip images in my head for art purposes, it comes easy. Mirroring is a little easy too. That's interesting. And honestly, it affects people so different. So when we say, you know, if you know one person with autism, you know, one person with autism, you know, it's not just a catchy phrase. It is true. Every single neurodivergence is so individual to the person. Um, and co-occurrence has a big part to play in that. So a quick question to all of you, do you or someone you know with ADHD also have another diagnosed condition? So think about like, yep, definitely, no, or you think, yeah, they probably do. And I know this isn't the biggest sample size, but 100% yeah. You know, I haven't met anyone who only has ADHD. They always have that and something else. And it's not them being greedy. It's just naturally part of it. But remember, there's like three different types. It could be something which is inherently born with as well or as part of, or it could be something that comes as a result of living with. We've got, I have ADHD and dyslexia, and my wife has ADHD and autism. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I've got a whole pack as well. Indigo says, I got diagnosed with dyslexia in 06. Then following my ASD assessment in 16 is my report that mentioned undiagnosed dyspraxia. Yeah, I believe I'm ADHD undiagnosed. And you know what? It's very possible. But honestly, are you going to get diagnosed for everything? Probably not. For so many reasons. One, you only get diagnosed for the things which impact you to a significant way. Two, uh, the people diagnosing you probably aren't trained in everything. And three, maybe people don't see the benefit in piling you with labels. 
I think it's important to know that you could have something and you could support it in another way, but not necessarily that you have to collect them all. This isn't like Pokemon, you know, one or two is more than enough. So a quick stat here are present in a quarter of all children of ADHD. So do you think depression is a quarter? Bipolar, general anxiety disorder or, or OCD? And have a quick think about which ones you think are in a quarter of all people with ADHD are also likely to have X of the following. Okay, it is in fact all of them. <laughs> yeah, depression, bipolar, anxiety disorder, OCD are all really, really, really common um, to have a part of the package of ADHD. And again, we're not just talking about all being um, a little bit obsessive over like, say, cleanliness or getting a bit down from time to time. We're talking like full blown conditions, um, things that affect you every single day to an irrational point. So individuals with ADHD can also have some of the following. They can also be big risk takers. You know, maybe they don't think so much about health and safety and they're just like, I'm going to do that. So they might uh, take more risks and they might not be as calculated as they should be. They unfortunately have a higher likelihood of substance abuse and alcoholism, drug dependencies. Again, I'm not saying everyone with ADHD does. But if you do have ADHD, stay clear of drugs, um, especially because the chances of you getting hooked is a lot higher. And uh, we actually do see that a lot um, with some of our one-to-ones, actually, that people who have substance abuse later found out that, oh, they got ADHD. And I'm not saying that made them have an addiction, but it definitely did not help. And lastly, criminal behavior. What can I say? We're scallywags. <laughs> no, but there is, again, a link between the two, that there is a higher population. For example, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but apparently 50% of prisoners are have dyslexia. And whether or not that's true or not, it does send a message that, you know, you're more likely to be neurodiverse and with a criminal record than those who are not. And I think that more comes down to having support, not being able to communicate effectively, society not understanding, than it inherently being part of it. So we don't want to start, you know, banning people with ADHD from shops. I, that's probably not the right way to go. And also Tourette's. So ADHD has found to be comorbidity with Tourette's syndrome. And you think about it, they're not too dissimilar. People with ADHD sometimes struggle to concentrate and to move. And those with Tourette's find doing like a rapid movement of some sort, whether it's a tick, a tremor, uh, anything along those lines helps kind of like relieve that like energy. I think the difference is with ADHD, it can be just like a little thing extra, but Tourette's, it can be extremely debilitating. So it normally depends on like the, the frequency or the amount it impacts you. Remember, it isn't just autism, that is a spectrum. All of neurodiversity is a spectrum. So it affects people in all different ways. And 60% of children with Tourette's have ADHD. So if you have Tourette's, you are more likely to have ADHD than you are not. But as I said with previous ones, it doesn't necessarily go the other way. So it's not like if you have ADHD, you're 60% more likely. It's just with Tourette's to ADHD. And that's because when it comes to things like Tourette's, we only see like the tip of the iceberg. So on here, you know, visibly, we see motor tics, verbal tics, but you can have ADHD, learning disabilities, behavior issues, rage, um, anxiety, um, more prone to bullying, sleep issues, sensory problems. So all of these things, are like interlinked with Tourette's. Uh, so again, it's, it's hard to say whether or not it's a separate condition, particularly when you're looking at over half of the amount of um, people diagnosed with it. So what do you do with this information? I guess to be honest, if you have Tourette's, it would also be worth when you're looking online on ways to support you and to get the most out of life, to not just be looking at 
uh, Tourette's websites, but also look at support that those with ADHD have found useful in the past. You really do not need to have a diagnosis for everything, but at least having an awareness that your body might benefit from support strategies that have worked for people who are diagnosed with ADHD might be beneficial. So, wow, we've, uh, we've been breezing through this, but now I want to get some thought provoking questions. And I told you we we're going to get a little bit controversial. And uh, so I'm going to see some questions and see what you can come up with. My first one, which is literally, I strongly disagree or I strongly agree, is do you feel your co-occurring conditions impact treatment effectively? So what do I mean by that? So you go to a doctor and you tell them, oh, just so you know, I've like, got a headache or something. Do they consider all your diagnosis when giving you the treatment? This one's particularly close to my heart because let's say you go to a, the doctors and you say, oh, you know, I'm getting these really bad headaches or whatever. They might kind of give you uh, like headache pills or they might send you to a brain scan. But as you have autism, it might be due to hypersensitivity or like the world around you. It might be more related to your autism than something else. For me, I get really bad headaches and sometimes, I genuinely, sometimes my hearing goes and people think, oh, it means I've got an ear condition. So they send me to an ear specialist, but actually it's due to my hypersensitivity. And when I'm stressed, my body kind of shuts down and the doctors do not always look at my record and take that into consideration. They just take the kind of symptoms that you describe. So this is the one that I said really close to my heart. And I'm not saying you should undermine your GP, but just make them aware that you have other conditions that they should be aware of. Even if it's on the record, do not take that for granted because I, I, I can't say how uh, well they read it, but I do know this is really common. We've got a message here saying, my uh, psychiatrist has, but that's definitely not always my experience. GPs rarely have time and want to separate every little thing. Frequently, you need good patient advocacy skills. Oh, see, Sarah, you are completely spot on there. You have to be your own advocate. I just assumed that my doctor always knew that I had other things. But again, then they, they typically are, remember, a GP is a generalist. So they typically are very good at general things. But when you've got comorbidity, you've got to take so many things in consideration. And that needle in the haystack becomes like, a needle in the entire world, it becomes very, very, very difficult to find the root cause. And it's often why a lot of people who are neurodiverse, particularly autistic, for example, and ADHD, don't always get the correct support they're looking for. Oh, Sunjan says, doctors, particularly GPs, only treat one condition at a time. If you mention anything else, they are not interested. And I've had that same experience as well. They're like, nope, we're on the clock, one condition per appointment. Life's not as simple as that, though, is it? it? It was all interconnected. So I told you about this controversial question. Now, there's this guy um, who did this big report, and to abbreviate, he found out that ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, Tourette's, and OCD are considered separate disorders. So all individual, not connected to each other. However, there is evidence to suggest that on the basis of comorbidity, they should be downgraded to symptoms that will appear in syndromes of developmental delay. So what is he saying here? Well, he's saying that at the moment we have lots of individual conditions, but they overlap so much, they're so interconnected, and the prevalence of having one or the other is so high should they not just be one condition, such as a developmental delay, and all of these things be a subcategory? So, for instance, I'm diagnosed with a developmental delay with um, autistic, um, with a subcategory of autism. And that is what I want to ask you. Essentially, what do you think about that? Is that something which you think would be positive, or do you think it'd be negative, or any kind of comments or opinions on that? So should we downgrade separate disorders to symptoms of developmental delay? And by the way, I'm not advocating for or against 
I just thought this was a really interesting question because as we see, you know, it, it are like may, maybe, maybe if you are diagnosed with developmental delay instead of all the others, the doctor will take all of it into consideration and more likely to like prune through the exact root cause. Or is that kind of making it too broad? Uh, they did that with autism, remember? They kind of joined it together to ASD. And now a lot of people feel that doesn't really represent who they are. They feel they've lost a bit, particularly those with Asperger's. Same with um, ADHD. You used to have ADD um, without the hyperactiveness, um, but now they kind of consolidated. So there's pros and cons to consolidating and not consolidating. Okay, Anna says, I like the idea, but that would be only in relation to ND conditions. Although the term developmental delay doesn't sound positive to some employers, I agree with that. I'm, I kind of think it's good because I think it would more encompass everything that goes on in my head. But let's face it, the name's not exactly the best branding. Barbara says schizophrenia can cause illnesses with executive functions as well. Absolutely. And schizophrenia is of common co-occurrence. We've got, yes, it's flexible and personal. Okay, interesting. No, and I, yeah, it, it is flexible uh, because it's, it sucks when you get diagnosed for ADHD and you don't have any more money or like energy to get diagnosed with something else. And then say you go to school, college, jobs, and they will not support you for something just because it's not in the exact wording. We've got, I don't think so. I will depends on what you get diagnosed. Yeah. Not really, because although the symptoms are various, it still makes it more complex. There's a spectrum within each, and knowing which spectrum you're looking at is helpful. It is true, actually. If you just go to someone saying, I've got a developmental disorder, they might not have the first clue in how to help you. But if you say, oh, I have dyslexia, you know, oh, okay, so I can do things in bullet points. I can go a bit slower. I can give you extra time. I think it makes it easier to minimize support. Uh, I think even though symptoms can be very, very similar, I'd say conditions are still very individual and that would create the problem of overgeneralizing and not seeing individuals. Uh, we've also got a comment that says, I think our difficulties as well as our strengths should be acknowledged rather than just put us into neat, tiny boxes. I think all your comments are really good. And to be honest, I'm really pleased to see a healthy debate for and against. I honestly wasn't sure what way this was going to go. I, I'm really not sure on how I feel. Personally, I think I'd rather just be called neurodiverse or neurodivergent, because for me, that talks about strengths and challenges rather than just challenges, which developmental delay does. When I think of developmental delay, I just think, oh, he sounds a bit slow, um, but maybe that's more me. Truthfully, there isn't an answer yet, but I do think it's a debate worth having because as we know, names and diagnostic aren't static. They are always changing. So to summarize what we learned today is that comorbidity is more than one disorder in the same person. Nice and simple. And neurodivergent individuals are more likely to have a comorbidity. This, I think, is something, again, really simple, but so useful when it comes to supporting others and supporting yourself. On our website, we have lots of characteristic quizzes of like, you know, do you have dyslexia? Do you have autism? And though I would never, ever recommend them to be used in any official capacity, they are useful to thinking, do you have some of the symptoms of another condition, which also might affect you as well? And just quickly before we round up and I give you a, f a few more kind of like next steps, follow on support, just to let you know that if any of you are neurodiverse and in the UK, um, there is a grant available called Access to Work, which means you can get funding like equipment, training, mentoring, coaching. And the best thing about it is regardless of diagnosis. So if you resonate with it, then you are typically eligible. So all I'd say is if you're in work in the UK, get in contact with us. Um, it, it, you know, I always recommend it because it seems uh, it's free support at the end of the day. So definitely recommend it. Now, any questions? Any questions or comments or statements around 
comorbidity. And uh, I know a lot of food for thought. Madeline says, I agree. It does seem to have a negative connotation. Yeah, I think a lot of them need rebranding. You know, like a lot of people are saying ASC, autism spectrum condition, rather than disorder now. I'm still undecided on using that term just because it's not the official term, but I support either or, to be honest. But I do agree, like things like disorder, delay, aren't particularly the most empowering. We've got a comment from Suri that says ADHD is confusing as there's not a deficit in attention, but a difference in regulating attention too. And that's a good point as well. I, I hate the word deficit. Indigo says, I really enjoyed this. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. And we have a web, our next webinar, which is on Thursday, is a really niche one, but an interesting one. And it's, am I synesthetic? So synesthesia is when you can kind of, uh, taste color or kind of see words um it's like a really it's quite rare but a really interesting neurodivergence now i don't think a lot of people will be synesthetic but if you just want to learn more about it and find out how does like color um and sound affects you um for instance maybe when you hear music you see the color red yeah it, it's really interesting so do join us for that oh and a quick message for, uh, barbara says this is all about comorbidity of different developmental disorders. What about men's, uh, mental illness and personality disorders? They do go hand in hand as well. I always tr I like to make it very different, being neurodiverse and mental illness. I, I tend not to join them together, but you are right that they, they do go together um, in terms of probably if you have one, you're likely to have another. Here's the link to our YouTube channel and uh, like and subscribe. We have all our weekly webinars all on there from the science of dyslexia, the history of autism. Like we have every subject you could possibly imagine at this point, I think. But do keep going back. Um, it's nice. And future webinars real quickly. We've got Am I Synesthetic next week. Then we've got a brief history of hidden disabilities, followed by the science of ADHD drugs. Dyslexia across culture and autism and sex, the difference in uh, the different chromosomes. So we take a bit of a deep dive. All of them are really interactive, easy to digest and all aimed at neurodiverse individuals. So obviously anyone can attend. Oh, actually, we've got loads. So I'll let you check them out in your own time. And a quick one. We do have individual Facebook groups where you can share opportunities, jobs, anything that comes to fancy. Just go on Facebook and type in autism opportunities. We also have a general one for everything called our Exceptional Individuals Opportunity Group. If you have enjoyed today, I do ask if maybe you can go on um, our Google site and leave us a review. The reviews are really helpful to help get more people to find out about us so we can offer support to everyone. The vast majority of all the work we do is free, always for neurodiverse individuals, and we only ever charge a very small fee to those who are able to. Uh, so a review is always greatly appreciated. And yeah, we've got a LinkedIn community, our online tests, which you can find on our website if any of you are curious whether or not, do you know what, Nat? Maybe I do have ADHD and you want to find a bit more about it, go on our website and find out more. And very lastly, the old fashioned way, pick up the phone if you want to contact us or drop us an email at admin at accept.co.uk. I really hope that you all enjoy today and you kind of got some gems out of it. Oh, and thanks for the lovely comments, everyone. Really appreciate it. Yes, Anna's going to give a great review. Thank you. I'll hold you to that. Cool. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Vicky. Appreciate it. Sanjan, as always. Hopefully I'll see some of you next week or in future uh, webinars. Have a great rest of your day. Cool. Cheers all.